welcome back. This is our last topic under Module 3, and uh, I want to devote it to a navigation in our lives subject, uh, specifically maritime safety, and uh, we'll take a look at the grounding of the Exxon Valdez. Um, and so here's a photo of Exxon Valdez. As you can see, it's a big, a fairly big oil tanker. Uh, this photo was taken just recently, taken, taken in March of this year, March of 2014. Uh, so it's not uh, a ground there, but it's a, a good photograph that gives you a feeling for the, the size of it. Um, the timeline is a sad one. It includes uh, March 24, 1989, and Valdez uh, had taken on a full load of crude oil in Prince William Sound from the Alaskan pipeline, and uh, she was bound for the City of Angels, more specifically Long Beach, and uh, as she was exiting the sound, uh, did make a course change to avoid an ice flow that people had reported by radio. And unfortunately, that maneuver went badly, and the Exxon Valdez ran aground on Bly Reef, uh, which is out in Prince William Sound. The hull came apart, ruptured, and they had 50 million gallons of crude oil on board, they spilled 11 million gallons of that into the Prudhoe Bay. And that, prior to 2010, was the largest oil spill ever in U.S. coastal waters. It was a real mess. Uh, it impacted about 1,000 miles of Alaskan coast. Later on, I'll show you uh, a timeline of uh, the impact on the uh, wildlife in that area. Uh, there have been bigger oil spills since, but uh, not many. Uh, this still ranks as, as certainly a, a terrible event. Um, here is a map showing the course of the Exxon Valdez, and it took on board oil uh, up in this direction, back that way, and she's coming out of the, the bay and was alerted to possible ice in the normal shipping lanes that uh, are used for tankers as they exit the sound. And so she swings uh, to the south and follows this path, you know, way outside now of the normal southbound lane, crosses the northbound lane and gets itself all the way down here. Somewhere in here it figures out that it's in the wrong spot and uh, starts to swing back and runs into uh, Bly Leaf Reef. And uh, they couldn't get it uh, off the reef. It, it, uh, it ran aground hard and it was stuck there. Um, if you're interested, there are any number of videos and uh, kind of mini movies online about uh, what may have happened that night. Uh, t take a look at them if you're interested. The, uh, the response of the community was rapid. Uh, there were certainly people on site within hours. Uh, however, it did take a long time to really put in place effective uh, mitigations. And, and so uh, the 11 million gallons flowed up and down, mostly down the Alaska coast. And here's just a photo of the damage we're talking about. This is just a uh, a nominal chunk of Alaskan coastline. You can see the black gunk on all the rocks on the right. As the tide goes up and down, the oil settles on the shore, and then you can certainly see the oil film there in the ocean. Uh, here's another appalling photograph that uh, shows the oil uh, that uh, remains after the tide came in and then went out. And so that was characteristic of uh, hundreds of miles of Alaskan coast. Here's a, a nice uh, view graph, if you want to call it that, from NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the U.S. And what they've done is plotted from the time of the accident, 1989, through to the present, the impact on the species and habitats, and at what point they began to uh, really return to health. And the bald eagle there you can see in 1996 it was doing reasonably well again some uh, seven years after the oil spill. But uh, we have come all the way out here to 2013 for the, recover of the sea, recovery of the sea otter 
and the harlequin duck. Um, here are some species which are still recovering. Notice that the sediments at the ocean bottom still, of course, reflect this uh, oil spill here, um, even some 25 years later. And here are some species and habitats that are not recovering, or we simply don't know how well they're doing. And so the killer whale, at least this pod AT1, has not recovered. The herring have not come back the way that uh, we would hope. And uh, we're still a little bit unclear on those birds shown there on the right. So it's fair to ask, why did this happen? The GPS is accurate to five meters. The Exxon Valdez was off course by thousands of meters. And uh, the fact of the matter was that at that time, GPS was not required carriage. And uh, they simply didn't know where they were. And to their credit, the U.S. Coast Guard responded to this by putting in a network of differential GPS stations around all of the U.S. coasts. And equally importantly, uh, that differential GPS network and the, the means for looking at the GPS signal and the means for broadcasting any corrections out to ships in the coastal waters was adopted worldwide and that was done by the International Association of Lighthouse Authorities. <clears throat> and if you think about it, that's an extremely apt and correct organization to worry about GPS and navigation in coastal waters. They're responsible for the lighthouses worldwide. So they took on, they added to their mission, this broadcast of differential GPS. We'll talk about, uh, we have talked about differential GPS earlier, and so this is a system that was implemented worldwide, and at its peak, there were about one and a half million users of uh, that differential GPS system. Today, it's being slowly phased out in favor of the space-based or satellite-based augmentation systems that we also talked about uh, earlier on, uh, but that function of GPS and GPS monitored was in part driven by disasters like the Exxon Valdez. Thank you for your attention.